Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Library, and the DeKalb Library Foundation, welcome to another in our continuing series of virtual author events. I'd also like to take this opportunity to wish those of you celebrating New Year, Lunar New Year, Happy New Year for the Year of the Tiger. And also, I would like to invite you all to join both us and the DeKalb County Public Library as we celebrate Black History Month this year, all month long. You can see our site for the list of events that we have coming up. And I encourage you to look at the DeKalb County Public Library's calendar of events for all of the events marked for Black History Month. As a reminder, if you would like to order a copy of the three death sentences of Clarence Henderson this evening, our bookseller tonight is Acapella Books. Acapella Books, like all other independent bookstores in Atlanta have done such a great job in the past few years during the pandemic to provide us with reading materials, as well as things like puzzles and games by mail, by pickup, or by delivery, that we would encourage you, no matter where you are, to please shop at your local independent bookstores, especially our Black-owned independent bookstores and businesses. A few things before we begin this evening. After our presentation, if you would like to ask a question, we encourage you to do so by typing it into the Q&A feature. You will find the Q&A button at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device. We've also enabled live transcriptions this evening for our guests that are hearing impaired. We put the link, of course, to order the book in the chat section, but feel free to go ahead and type your questions in there as well, in case you have something that you would like to ask, and we'll be sure to monitor that as well. So this evening, I would like to introduce our guests first. Chris Joyner is an investigative reporter with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution with more than two decades of experience in journalism, ranging from community newspapers to national and international news and wire services. His reporting interests include local and state government, political extremism, campaign finance, and government ethics. He reported from the scene of Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and the Deepwater Horizon spill of 2010. He wrote about street gangs and life inside a supermax prison, the hidden world of government lobbying, and white collar criminal network built around drug testing labs. Of course, he lives in Atlanta, Georgia now, but he, like his book, began in Carrollton, Georgia, where this interesting story began on Halloween night in 1948. And of course, being a young and intrepid writer, he found himself going to a courthouse and finding records in a box and then peeling back all of the layers of this unbelievable story that includes a fiery communist leader, NAACP lawyers, racism, classism, communism, and the battle of rural versus urban. All of these themes are so very prescient even in today's society. So welcome, Chris, and please tell us about this fascinating story. Thank you so much, Joe. I really appreciate you having me here. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very exciting opportunity to talk about this book that means a lot to me. Uh, uh, it is a book that, uh, as Joe said, I began working on as a young writer, and as you can probably see, I'm not as young a writer as I used to be. Um, I uh, happened upon the story uh, when I was at my very first newspaper as a general assignment reporter uh, in Carrollton uh, in the late 90s uh, and did a bunch of research on it and uh, then got another newspaper job and I put all that research in a box and Move, and it moved with me over 20 years until I dug it out uh, about five years ago and started uh, actually reintroducing myself to what I think is a really interesting story about a really interesting time. The, the book revolves around the death of uh, Charles Buddy Stevens, I'm sorry, Carl Buddy Stevens, uh, a 21-year-old white man in Carrollton who is shot to death while protecting his date from a uh, masked would-be rapist. Uh, the, the death of uh, Buddy was so devastating for the community uh, that it, you know, there became this tremendous demand to find a culprit. And there was a massive manhunt and eventual uh, arrest and indictment of uh, Clarence Henderson, 
and who was tried several times, three times uh, for the for the crime. I'm going to be reading from chapter three, which really gets uh, at what I think is what, the interesting part of this story, which is the uh, the tension of this period between uh, communities' desire uh, for progress after years of depression and war, uh, and its paranoia about what that progress might bring. So this is going to pick up from after the murder and um, the beginning of the manhunt and how the community reacted to that. This is chapter three, A Desperate Manhunt. From the bloody and impoverished frontier to an industrious, educated, modern city, Carrollton was blossoming. That's why the death of Buddy Stevens struck so deep and why the mystery of his murder was so troublesome. Two weeks had passed since the Halloween homicide and police had yet to make an arrest. So it was news when Buddy's parents showed up at the monthly city council meeting. The Stevensons were grieving parents who had lost their only child, but they were also influential figures in Carrollton's white professional class. When Buddy was gunned down, they were in the midst of building their dream house in Sunset Hills, the very spot where Buddy and Nan, Nan was Buddy's girlfriend, where Buddy and Nan had been abducted. By Christmas, they would move in, becoming the only the second residence of the development after Judge Sam Boykin. The council meeting was a pageant of small town decorum. Charles C. Stevens, Buddy's mother, spoke for the family. She began by praising the police, an act designed to soften the field for the coming criticism. Quote, we want to personally express our appreciation for the efforts that have been put forth to apprehend the criminal who murdered our son, she said. However, she suggested those efforts might have been enhanced had the city police only known what they were doing. The city might benefit from FBI investigative training to learn the most modern methods, she said. It was clear she had done her research because she knew that such classes were offered to local police several times a year. In fact, Carrollton police had had such training in 1947, but a number of new officers had been hired in the expanding police city, city police force since that time, she said. Under such circumstances, Mrs. Stevens said, mothers and daughters were afraid to leave their homes knowing that her son's murderer was at large. Quote, many mothers in Carrollton are extremely distressed now as a result of this tragedy, and for the benefit of the public, we should seek uh, to provide the very best police protection possible, she said. Members of the council solemnly nodded their heads. It was uncomfortable. Some people were crying but not Miss Stevens, who said she hoped her son's death would spark a keen interest in providing the force with proper training. It was a tough spot for Stanley Parkman, whose newspaper had, was founded on boosting the city, not criticizing it, Stanley Parkman being the publisher of one of two daily newspapers in Carrollton. Swallowing hard on civic pride, he couched his words carefully, calling Mrs. Stevens the valiant mother and reporting that she offered improvements that, quote, have become obvious as a result of this crime. The paper didn't print those obvious suggestions, but reasonably one might expect that Miss Stevens was referring to the management of the crime scene. News photos from that night showed investigators casually hand handling pieces of evidence at the scene, hats perched on the backs of their heads. Then Mrs. Stevens dropped a bomb. The city patrolman who had taken the initial call from Nan Turner didn't respond by dispatching city police to the scene. As a result of the rollback of recent annexation, the attack occurred just outside the city limits. Call the sheriff, the patrolman advised. That confusion gave the suspect additional time to make his escape. This was news to the city council. They knew by now, of course, that the murder happened outside of the city, but they were unaware that the initial call was ignored. Sensing a rising tide of blame, Police Chief Rada Threadgill jumped to his feet, telling the council that the patrolman had followed the correct procedure and called him at home for orders. The chief said he rounded up a posse and was on the scene that evening. In the next edition of The Georgian, which is the daily newspaper Parkman printed, Parkman described the extraordinary session as one of the highest compliments ever paid to the mayor and the city council of Carrollton. That's one way to look at it. Weeks passed following Stephen's death, and White Carrollton was nervous. 
rumors began spreading around town that prominent people were involved in the murder. The loose talk angered Chief Threadgill, who released a mildly threatening statement, quote, these wild rumors that are going around are completely unfounded, and we are willing to talk to anyone about them and straighten them out, he said. Parkman took the front took to the front page with an editorial masquerading as a byline news article upbraiding city folk for spreading gossip. Quote, these rumors, such as have broken out over the weekend, not only do serious damage to the person involved, but they are damaging to the entire community. He wrote in the peculiar way the Georgian had of making every story boosterish. Folks could hardly be blamed for uh, filling uh, the information void with guesswork. A serial rapist. A Negro was loose and attacking young white women, and Chief Threadgill wasn't reassuring anybody that police were close to capturing him. There have been no new arrests in the case for more than a week, the chief said. We have started at the very beginning of the case and are checking all the evidence at hand. We are checking all similar cases that took place before the Stevens case. At the very beginning? No wonder there were rumors of well-to-do and powerful people involved. It smelled like a cover-up. In another story, the Times Free Press, which was the competing newspaper, announced that the GBI had assigned the case to a two-man team. Tom Price, a veteran investigator, was joined by James T. Hillen, and they were devoting their efforts full-time to the case. Price and Hillen started from scratch. Witnesses were brought in for questioning. They went to the crime scene. Rumors were run to ground. But two weeks into the job, Price and Hillen were no further along. On December 9th, Parkman placed a reminder on the front page that the, that the case was still unsolved. The reward had grown to $1,200, and any tip could break the case, he wrote. Quote, it's a deadly serious matter, Parkman wrote. The next victim could be your son or daughter, or even you. Parkman wrote that Price and Hillen were open for business, but if someone wanted to pass that case-breaking tip along to the Georgian instead, that would be just fine. Quote, for the safety of the community, to clear away our doubts and suspicions, he wrote, in the name of decency, this case needs to be solved. On the same day, the Times Free Press took a different approach, appealing to a different audience. Quote, an appeal to local Negroes, the featured editorial began. Much of the evidence, and it's not too convincing, in the Stevens murder case and the series of attacks preceding it indicate the man was a member of your race. The tone was reasonable, with publisher Clyde Tuttle noting that, quote, all races have their good and their bad, as well as the deranged or manic type. Then came the hard sell for blacks striving to make good with white Carrollton. Quote, Negroes will be doing their race and the improvement of racial relations, a good deed by assisting in every way with the searching investigations being made of the murder and attacks, he wrote. Talk to the police. The way whites looked at it, race relations in Carrollton were fine. The December 16, 1948 edition of the Georgian carried a front page article recounting a recruiting visit by the Ku Klux Klan. In a tone a bit smug, the brief used anonymous sources to report that Klan recruiters didn't have much luck. But the superior tone wasn't some PM to racial reconciliation. Instead, it was an olive branch to the local police to the job the local police were doing in holding down unrest. Quote, general opinion is the officers of the law are doing a fine job maintaining order and need no outside assistance of the KKK type, the newspaper reported. At the dawn of the 1950s, Georgia was an intensely segregated state, the result of decades of white ruling class clawing back what Reconstruction had sought, however briefly, to install. Georgia author and social critic Lillian Smith argued segregation emerged from an unholy bargain between rich and poor whites that elevated poor whites minimally, but enough to justify the system itself. But Smith said the system could only survive for as long as the individuals would accept the corruption of it. As for whites, they did accept it. Moreover, they defended it, not only with terrorist organizations like the Ku Klux Klan, but also through the mechanism of government. In 1953, Georgia Attorney General Eugene Cook, a politician who mixed his strong segregationist stands with rabid anti-communism, penned, penned a long letter to his opposite number in Virginia to bolster that state's defense against integrating public schools. 
in building his case that the state's ratification of the 14th Amendment was disconnected from the idea of integration of schools, Cook listed the variety of ways Georgia had sought to keep the races apart. For example, interracial marriage was a felony, punishable by up to two years in prison. While in prison, the law required whites and blacks to be kept in separate institutions. Also in Georgia, churches, cemeteries, private schools, and colleges were exempt from property tax as long as the separation of the races was observed. Historian Newman V. Bartley wrote that Georgia swayed under the increasing weight of an untenable and, quote, decaying social institution that had lost intellectual respectability. Segregation was a mounting moral quandary within the American conscience. But white resistance to reform was strong. Talmadge and the other white uh, Georgia leaders urged massive resistance to challenges to, quote, the Southern way of life. In response, Blacks voted with their feet, leaving the state and the South by the millions, heading north to cities with better jobs and less restrictive covenants. Segregationists in Georgia waved the Confederate battle flag at them as they left. By 1956, in response to Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court case declaring segregated schools unconstitutional, Georgia's General Assembly voted to incorporate the battle flag into the state flag itself as the dominant motif, an unmistakable message. The bargain between rich and poor whites to maintain segregation while driven by deep-seated beliefs in white superiority was not simple race hatred. Bartley wrote that the more practical considerations were at work as well. The fall of segregation would decimate the school systems of poor counties, which catered only to the children of whites and barely that. A flood of black children, impoverished, deprived, and undereducated by generations of social, political, and economic disfranchisement would drive down educational attainments to levels even below their current meager status. In the late 1940s, the schools in Carroll County struggled to pay salaries that, and ran monthly budget deficits. Were it not for the largesse of some of the county's leading men, the schools would have folded entirely, and that's with a segregated system that seriously tried to educate only the white majority. Aside from their lack of resources, the prospect of integration and federal control were anathema to white leaders. In 1948, Lieutenant Governor Marvin Griffin came to Carrollton to deliver a stem winder of a speech to local Rotarians aimed at the heart of the issue. The Georgian carried a summary of the speech on the front page. In, conclude, quote, in, in concluding his address, Mr. Griffin warned against begging for too much federal aid, especially for school purposes. He said he is afraid too much federal money for schools would bring in federal control of our school system which is one additional long step away from liberty. A decade after this speech during Griffin's scandal-plagued term of governor, he would threaten to close the state's public schools rather than integrate. Within a, dec within a decade, white reformers in Atlanta would adopt a new approach for the city too busy to hate. While the diehard white supremacists urged state leaders to close the public schools before integration, moderates like Atlanta mayors William B. Hartsfield and Ivan Allen weighed the dying carcass of segregation against their city's future prospects as a truly global city of commerce and chose the latter. Hartsfield and later Allen, who came to the city's top office via the Chamber of Commerce, urged the city's business class to keep the public schools open as a symbol of the city's commitment to economic progress. Black voters flocked to the white moderate candidates, pushing them even more towards integration. But that day was far off in Carrollton, where Judge Boykin said in the local press that the city was not ready for the races to collide, even to serve the most desperate hopes of the commercial class. Still, Boykin and other city civic leaders took pride that while segregated, Carroll County was no haven for the uglier aspects of white supremacy like the Ku Klux Klan. Shortly after the new year, Carrollton's white leaders got the news they had longed to hear. Police had arrested a 27-year-old farmhand named Tyler North for the murder of Buddy Stevens. The Atlanta Constitution broke the story on January 13, 1949, under the banner headline, Carroll Slaying Suspect Bound Over. In Carrollton, the Georgian and Times Free Press headlines were more pointed, each identifying North as a, quote, Carrollton Negro. The relief was palpable. The Times Free Press reported that the arrest was a surprise since, quote, the general public had assumed the case had been dropped. 
In fact, North had been arrested several weeks earlier and held in secret, along with a half dozen other black men police were interrogating. The Constitution crowed that it had known about the arrest for some time, but had not identified North at the request of law enforcement. Why exactly was North a suspect? The police weren't saying. Prosecutor Wright Lipford, whose formal title was Solicitor General of the Coweta Judicial Circuit, released a statement to the press saying the evidence against North would be provided to the grand jury in three months. Newspapers described North as, quote, a light-colored Negro, six feet tall and weighing 175 pounds. Lipford told reporters North had left his home south of Carrollton shortly after the Stevens murder and was arrested in Atlanta. The farmhand was married with three children and lived in Carrollton his whole life, with the exception of the time he spent while in the Army in the South Pacific during World War II. The papers reported that he was taking classes offered under the GI Bill, which might have been why he was in Atlanta. Perhaps fearing violence or just to give him a more convenient location to question the suspect, Lipford stashed north in the Noonan Jail, 20 miles away, where he was under the watchful eye of Lamar Potts. Potts was sheriff of Coweta County and something of a folk hero. He made national news with the 1948 conviction of John Wallace, a powerful land baron from a neighboring county who had murdered a white tenant farmer and burned the body. The story, which combined a willingness to confront the powerful with, an impressive, with impressive forensics advances, had captured the imaginations of Georgians who had grown used to government corruption. Much later, Margaret Ann Barnes' retelling of the incident as murder in Coweta County would become a bestseller and be made into a TV movie starring Johnny Cash as Potts and Andy Griffith as the villainous Wallace. There were, separate sim there were apparent similarities between the Coweta and Carroll cases. North had been arrested in part based on the forensic work of Dr. Herman Jones in the Fulton County Crime Laboratory. The Constitution reported the lab found traces of human blood on North's corduroy britches. Police had raided North's home and seized the pants prior to his arrest, likely on a tip, although every black man was a suspect in the murder. The Georgians' partment took to the editorial page to praise investigators and express confidence using an odd bit of logic. Because North had been in custody for weeks before it was announced that he had been charged, Partman reasoned, it was safe to assume that the case had to be strong against him. Quote, since the arrest of this suspect and the early belief on the part of the investigators that he was guilty may have been able to more or less take their time, being more careful than usual to see everything tied together, Partman wrote. There was no rush about making formal charges and announcement of the charge to the public, end quote. One might reasonably argue the opposite. North was held in secret for weeks because the police weren't sure he was a good candidate for the murder and were saving themselves the embarrassment. Carrollton had been searching for this kind of relief. Someone had been caught and the city could rest easy, but Parkman said the Stevens murder had caused some introspection among residents about the future. Quote, we realize that some of the horrible things we read about can happen to us in peaceful, quiet Carroll County, he wrote. I hope the officers have the right man. End quote. So that's the beginning of the third chapter, which gets into the manhunt and the police settling on an initial suspect named Tyler North. Obviously, from the title of the book, Tyler North won't be the person who's tried and uh, convicted of the case. But that gives you an idea of sort of the, the atmosphere of the late 1940s, early 1950s in Carrollton and Georgia, and really much of the nation uh, in that decade following World War II, where the country was struggling with uh, a lot of pinup desires that uh, after World War II and uh, also the pressures to address longstanding racial grievances that had been put off during the Depression and the war. So, Joe, um, how do we want to proceed here? Do we want to? Uh... Sure. So if anyone has any questions, I'm going to remind you all again, go ahead and put them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, feel free to do that at any time. I've got a few that we can start out with as warm-ups. So just right now, of course, you did allude, Chris, to the fact, you know, the, the book has a title of The Three Death Sentences of Clarence Henderson. Um, you were talking about North. Um, 
you know, there was also a, a junior teal that was a, that was a suspect in this. You know, how did you know the folks in Carrollton? What, what was the, I guess, the impetus to shift from North and from Junior Teal? Um, and you know, Teal kind of was a, was a bootlegger, was a little bit notorious. You know, how did they they make that shift? Was, was there something? one thing or was it a series of things that shifted the focus from you know these two suspects to henderson i think one of the things about Carrollton that's important to understand is that uh murders were not unknown in Carrollton. people were killing other people in Carrollton all along but a real whodunit murder a kind of random crime murder and particularly one that was connected with sexual assault, which is which this was uh, it was uh, a serial rapist had been working in that area for months, attacking couples in lovers' lanes and scaring off the boy and and raping his date. Uh, that kind of thing was unknown to Carrollton, and uh, what you generally had when you had a murder in Carrollton was two people who have known each other maybe their whole lives got into an argument and one of them killed the other one and there was never a question about who did it it was the question became well what do you do about it now um with this crime there was immense pressure to find a suspect junior teal as you mentioned was an initial suspect um he was found uh on foot near the crime scene uh and he appeared to be roughed up there were some other sort of physical signs that's connected into the crime. Um, the problem was is that police were uh, convinced that they were looking for a black suspect and Junior Teal was white. They still held him, uh, subjected him to some newfangled uh, technology, uh, in, including uh, the very first lie detector test given to anyone in, in, a, in a criminal setting in Georgia. But Soon after Teal, they moved on to the idea that they would be looking for a black suspect, and they they arrested perhaps dozens of black men on little evidence. Um, and uh, and the way I've described this before is in looking for a suspect, the you know white Carrollton essentially grabbed black Carrollton and shook black Carrollton until a suspect popped out. Tyler North was the initial suspect. Um, and uh, he would be held for the better part of a year without being indicted. Uh, and, if, and he would, in fact, never be indicted for this crime, uh, which put, the, uh, put White Carrollton back in sort of the flat-footed position it had been of having no good candidate. It would be months more before they, they landed on Clarence Henderson uh, through a really sort of tortured logic of uh how a, how a gun might have passed through his hands so um i have a question that one of the question that we were talking about mm -hmm. before we, we started recording but before we get to that about small towns and, and things like that um we also discussed you know this amazing sort of whack pack of characters that, that you had in this. I mean, it, it's almost very Southern Gothic. You know, I, I loved the the one particular instance you describe of the police chief marching into the newspaper publisher's office and slamming his gun and his badge down on the desk and challenging him to a fight outside. You know, this is, I mean, it, it seems stereotypical of all of these great Southern movies where the lawman does this kind of thing. Um, but of all of these, these people that were involved in this case in Carrollton, Georgia, you know, are there a few or, or one that, you know, you think that we as Georgians really should know, you know, as this case, you know, it's, it's 74 years ago, you know, as people start to, um, you know, shuffle loose the mortal coil, we lose all of the connections to this case, you know, who is it that we should maybe try and, and remember from this? Well, one of my favorite characters is uh, the defense attorney, Daniel Duke. Uh, and I, th I think he is a 
you know, a true hero. He's not a perfect man. He has his flaws. He's a, he's a, a fiery man. It loses his temper easily. It sometimes gets him in trouble, but he was one of the few white attorneys that was willing to take on black defendants uh, and vigorously defend them. Um, you know, whether it was for criminal cases or voting rights cases. And uh, he was, I think, in some ways, really heroic for what he was willing to do. Uh, he would eventually go on to become a Fulton County judge and, and have a career uh, behind the bench as well, where he was also sort of notorious for his personality. So he's one of my favorites. Um, you know, he, he was someone who really bristled at injustice, uh, brooked no disagreements on that. Um, there's a passage in the, in the book where he is in a judge's chambers. Uh, this is back when he was a state prosecutor working for the uh, attorney general's office, and he was tasked with breaking up some, uh, both the local chapters of the Ku Klux Klan and a fascist organization that was, that rose up uh, out of World War, out of post, the post-war era. And he actually gets into a fist fight with the defendant um, in a judge's chamber. So, I mean, I just think those kind of larger than life characters are really cool. Um, one, another thing I like are, are uh, Clarence Henderson's black attorneys who were uh, courageous in a way that, you know, was well beyond the way Dan Duke had to be courageous because not only were they taking on this case in a highly charged atmosphere, they were the only black attorneys that anyone had ever seen in Carroll County. You know, when they showed up at the courthouse, it was news and it was impossible for them to hide. They took their lives in their hands every time they went there. And that's S.S. Robinson and E.E. E. Moore. I wish more was known about these uh, early pioneers of the black, uh, uh, the black bar. They had offices on Auburn Avenue and were founding members of the Gate City Bar Association, which was the historic black bar. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of that early part of the history is still being dug out by uh, black lawyers who are interested in this right now. Uh, and I look forward to learning more about uh, more and Robinson. Hopefully this book will inspire some deeper research into their personalities. But, I, but what I was able to find out about them was, I thought, very courageous. So, and, you, and of course, you were just now talking about Carrollton and, and, you know, life sort of like in a small town in this time period. And, and there were a lot of social issues going on. But what is it what is about these kind of cases um, that really shakes and then shapes these small towns? Um, you know, what, you know, how does it cause the town to be, you know, almost reflective? You know, like you said, you know, Carrollton was, was kind of progressive, but then to a point that it wasn't though. So, I mean, you know, there's a dichotomy in here, but there's also that, you know, there was some kind of transformation for the town by this. You know, I think it's when they happen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it could have been any number of things uh, that mm -hmm. that rocked Carrollton. It just happened to be this kind of random murder that had both racial and uh, uh, sexual overtones to it uh, that was so threatening. Uh, but it could have been something else. You know, it could have been a sit-in. Mm -hmm. uh, it could have been... I mean, like I say, any number of things could happen because of when it happened. This happens during a period where the country as a whole is is doing a lot of things at once, trying to grow, trying to shake off war and depression, uh, being forced to address racial inequities that are now no longer uh, so easy to ignore. And then there's also an existential threat coming from outside, the fear that there's a foreign government that threatens the United States institutions, that the, that the, that the United States could weaken to the point where it could not you know, go on as people expected it would, as a, as a free and democratic nation. And that leads us into the period of the Red Scare, which is happening here at the same time. So I think the reason why Buddy Stevens' murder was so earth-shaking 
was because of all the things that happened around Buddy Stevens' murder, both in Carrollton and and sort of more broadly in the nation. Now, what was it that brought you back around to the story? You know, you were young, starting in journalism. You know, you went to the courthouse and, and you know, they produced this wooden crate of information for you. Um, mm. And I mean, I jokingly said this to you earlier that, you know, it's very much like my small hometown that I grew up, you know, the county clerk, you know, that was the county clerk since before I was born, you know, only passed away a few years ago and was the county clerk for my entire existence. Um, and that seems very small town, I think, everywhere. But, you know, what, what brought you back around to the story as well? Well, I, initially, you know, when I was a young reporter um, and was working in Carrollton, I got the, the tip from my father. And he had gone to West Georgia as an undergrad, and I had gone to West Georgia as an undergrad. Uh, and now here I was back in Carrollton working for this newspaper. And he said, you know, when I was uh, not long out of college, there was a boy that got killed in Carrollton uh, named Buddy Stevens. He said, I don't think they ever figured out who did that. You should look in the old copies of the paper and see what you can find about it. And I pulled those um, uh, bound copies down and flipped through them and got really interested in the story, the narrative of it, um, and did a lot of research at that time, several years going weekends in the, in the library, uh, looking at microfilm and, uh, you know, gathering and sorting and, and then never did anything with it. Um, and in um, several years back, when I uh, was back in Atlanta after working in several other places, I was working for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, I started listening to the podcast Serial, um, the very first season of it, and I just found it was so great. And every of course, you know, it was a sensation when it came out. And I was trying to figure out what is it about it that is so interesting to me, and it was... I, it occurred to me that the journalism of it was this willingness to go really deep um, into a, an event that you didn't know anything about, you had no particular connection to, and really explore sort of like the individual issues of that case, and what does it mean more broadly. And, I, and it occurred to me, I said, well, you know what, I've got a box that has a lot of research in it that has that story buried in it somewhere, and that is, uh, that's, that evening, I pulled the one of the notebooks out and started flipping through my clips uh, and just started writing. And it, and I'm kind of glad that I took that break uh, because I don't think I was I don't think I was mature enough to write the story that I ended up writing. Um, I probably could have written a pretty good true crime story about Buddy Stevens' murder. But I don't know that I had sort of the breadth of experience to bring all the other aspects of what was going on at the time and into the story. Yeah, and you know, I think really that's what makes your book so distinctive and so readable is that it's just not a basic true crime book, that there are so many layers to it. And it's so deep, it, it does really make you think and, and have to piece together in your head what was going on at the time that would make people react in such a way, you know, and, and putting that whole timeline together. You know, I even found myself thinking, you know, he was only 21. You know, he comes back, you know, from Korea and he's really only 21 when this happens too. And then, the, you know, all of this sort of like community fallout that happened after that too. It was, you know, it's like, oh, you know, he was so young and it, it was, you know, could have been such an innocent time. And then it really wasn't. Yeah. And this is, you know, and Buddy Stevens really is a symbol for what Carrollton thought it could become. You know, here was this, you know, educated young man. He was an Eagle Scout. He came from a prominent family. Uh, he was dating the, uh, you know, a, a, a literal beauty queen who won a beauty pageant, you know, was Miss Carrollton. It was sort of really an idealized version of, you know, an American boy. And in that way, he sort of symbolized the idealized, 
you know, notion of who Carrollton, what Carrollton thought it could become. And when he was cut down, I think it was really as, you know, so it, it, it was really an introspective period uh, for that community as to what that meant. We do have a question for the audience that I want to get to. So Carol asks, do you think if done properly and true to your book that a movie should be made to again emphasize the era of Southern bigotry, injustices, and racial overtones to illustrate the truth behind life facts in America's history? Well, I am entertaining those offers if they ever arrive. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I do think that you could do that. But it, one of the things that if, if someone were to come to me and say, hey, let's do this Southern Gothic story about the South uh, in, uh, you know, 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, and we'll get into these issues that affected the South, I would say, no, this is an American story. It's in the, I mean, the Carrollton may be geographically located in the South, but there's nothing that is specifically South that is happening there that is not also happening in Levittown, New Jersey, or in uh, Indianapolis or any of these other communities that are going through their own, uh, you know, sort that are that are dealing with the same issues, uh, and and I would stress that you know don't you know don't give me train whistles and uh, harmonica. That's not what this story is about. This is about modern America and the and the truths of modern American history. Yeah, and you know, I, I you know once again, I mean. It it really was a lot of the, the themes in the book really resonate with today's politics as well. You know, I, I one of the things we again were talking about earlier before we started was, um, you know, because the Olympics do start on February 3rd um, and we were talking about um, Catherine Hardy, won uh, Olympic gold medal in, in 52 for the four by one and, you know, of course, Clarence Henderson is being held into jail and she is, is having a celebration in her honor for winning the gold medal, but. Uh, right. And in, in the book, uh, Catherine Hardy is introduced. She is, you know, having gone to the Olympics and won a gold medal. She is African-American woman who grew up in Carrollton and Carrollton wants to recognize this great achievement. They have a gold medal winner who's a local product, uh, but they only want to go so far. You know, um, so, you know, Catherine, um, uh, uh, Catherine Hardy did not go to West Georgia College, for instance. She applied and was turned down because of her race. Uh, when she comes back home for the parade, uh, you know, white Carrollton comes out, as does black Carrollton. And when the, you know, at the, uh, at the ceremony at the end of the parade, there are segregated sections. You know, they don't sit together to honor her. So, I mean, it is, it, is an, it is an attempt by this community to put its toe into the water of, you know, recognizing the achievements of African-Americans, but is only willing to go so far. Mm -hmm. and, and I do think that's, an, that's, that's where we were during this period is we're at that pivot point where America is really waking up to the sort of uncomfortable truths of, of their dual system uh, that, that has a subjugated class and a ruling class. And you're going to see that play out in the courtroom and you'll see it play out in the Georgia Supreme Court in the book, but you also see it play out in you know, more ordinary or prosaic ways uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, you know, also with that little bit of sport history, you know, that also was the time where, you know, it became, you know, sports kind of became our annual and, and you know, you know, quadrennial USA versus the USSR as well. And it was sort of like our, our ability to try and beat back communism with athleticism and, you know, medal counts became important. And, um, you know, the great miracle on ice of 1980, you know, and it's like, and you're, you're kind of seeing that, rear, you know, even though we're supposed to, you know, the Cold War was supposed to be over, you know, now we're kind of seeing that again with modern Russia is that, you know, through sport, this Cold War again is being waged. 
Um, and, you know, it may not be called communism now, but it, it's, you know, still. It's, an, not- it's, it's an external threat. It is, uh, it is a, an alternate, sort of an alternate uh, path. And, and, and during this period uh, of the book, you know, there's tremendous paranoia that, you know, international communism could bring America to its knees. Uh, and, uh, and that threat was not, uh, I mean, was not unreasonable. Um, there, was a, there was a real international battle for the hearts and minds. And when America has to confront the fact that it's got a second class, subjugated class of people, um, they have to wonder, well, do, you know, if we're going to live up to our principles, we have to start addressing this. Meanwhile, you know, the, the Communist Party in the United States of America really thought that African Americans would be the way socialist revolution happened, particularly in the South, that the road to communism would occur through the South uh, by uh, addressing the injustices to African Americans, at least a lot of, a lot of communists did. Mm-hmm. And, and that's something that plays out in this book. And I got to say, is when I was doing the initial research, one of the most surprising things that it, that happened was when I discovered, oh my goodness, the Communist Party is deeply involved in this story, which is, you know, I found kind of unexpected for 1948, 1950, you know, Carrollton, Georgia. Yeah. Another question come in. Um, <laughs> thank you, Melissa, for the question. It's like, um, and the book is new, so I'm not exactly sure whether it the, the first part of this question will obtain or not. But it says, has your book been banned yet for K through 12 and universities in Georgia? Um, sorry for the snarky rhetorical question, uh, but you know we are also living in an age um, where history and book banning are, are becoming a thing. Um, but she also asks, have you considered offering a book talk to high schools? Um, and would young people benefit from hearing about this case? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, it is, I think because it's, and, and I, I would recommend it, I suppose, for the, you know, like junior, senior year high school, you know, mm-hmm. where they've had, they've got some exposure to some of the materials that would, that would, so it would make sense to them in a, in a, in a deeper way. But yeah, I, I, mean, I could certainly see high schoolers being interested in this, if nothing else, because I, I do think it is, it is a readable way to take your history medicine. Um, you know, you get an idea of some things that happen uh, both in Georgia and across the United States during a period that I think is not really well understood and is um, maybe, you know, the Depression and World War II are always going to be taught. And after that, there's really sort of a jump into the 1960s into sort of like the uh, where a little more of the action is in the civil rights movement. And what is missed is that bridge period between World War II and, say, 1960, uh, 19 or, or at very least in the mid 50s. And to really show sort of how complicated that period is. And I, and I do think that's something that would be you know, it would be news to a lot of, uh, a lot of readers, particularly at the high school level. I think certainly college students will get, a, would get a lot out of this. Those that are, that are just getting seriously into the, into the study of history. Mm-hmm. And so, it hasn't been banned yet, but I, you know, <laughs> we'll see, you know, there, <laughs> you never know. It does mention communism. We could it, be in trouble. We could it, be in trouble. It does. So let me grab one more question. Um, so another question, um, from Carol this evening, when researching this book, did you travel back to Carrollton after being away for so many years? I did. Um, you know, I had a lot of the basic research that I needed. Um, but one of the things, and, and this is, this is sort of a white knuckle, uh, journey that I went on. Um, I was deep into writing, maybe I was about 25, 30% into the manuscript 
when I realized that my early um, research, I had uh, incomplete court transcripts. I did not have the complete court transcripts. And there were three trials. What I had, and, and you alluded to it, you know, when I was a young reporter, I went to the county clerk uh, of courts or the clerk of courts. And I said, you know, I'm interested in this case. Do you know anything about it? And I said, it's the Buddy Stevens murder. And without moving, she just reached under the counter and pulled out this big oaken, oak, uh, oaken box and reached in and pulled out about 80 pages. And she said, you know, we keep these up here because everybody wants to come look at the Buddy Stevens case. And so I was like, give me everything. Um, what I really had there was um, not a full transcript, but a partial transcript that was prepared uh, for the first appeal. And I realized as I started writing it that if I really wanted to write the narrative I wanted to write, I would need complete transcripts for all trials. So I did make a trip at that point to Carrollton and went to the courthouse. Uh, in the intervening 20 years, they had built a new courthouse. So I went to the new courthouse and said, you know, I'm, I need to look at some trial transcripts from a really old trial about 70 years ago. Enough time had passed where they didn't keep it in a box underneath the counter anymore. And uh, I asked them, you know, they, they let me go down into the stacks where the archived cases were. And I went by number to where I knew it should be. And it wasn't there. None of the cases were there. No, no transcripts, no briefs, no motions, nothing. Just a, like, a, like a missing tooth. And no one knew. I went to the um, clerk of courts. They were like, well, it should be down there. I went to the district attorney. They had no idea. Um, and I discovered in my research that a, a forensic scientist had written a book about Dr. Herman Jones, who founded the state crime lab and is a character in this book. And his book on Dr. Herman Jones had an appendix at the end that referenced this case and appeared to quote from a transcript. So I got in touch with that author and I said, where is, you know, where did you get these transcripts? He said, well, it was a long time ago. He said, but I had a district attorney's investigator help me find them. And so i I found that woman who had since retired and I asked her, I said, where did you get these? And she goes, Oh, well, that was at the old courthouse uh, before they moved to the new one. And I think those were in the evidence room because it was still an open case. And so I sent an email, you know, I was kind of, you know, anything could have happened when they moved, when they moved to the new courthouse, you know, and, and the, and the court courts had told me this, said, they may have gotten thrown away when we moved. So I sent him an email and said, well, this is what this investigator said. And 10 minutes later, I get a phone call. He said, I've got them all. I've got all the transcripts and I've got the prosecution exhibits and I've got the, the gun and the bullet that was extracted from Buddy Stevens' body. He said, they were all in our new evidence room. He said that when, when, when the movers came, they just picked everything up out of the old evidence room, put it in the new evidence room. It's been sitting there for 20 years on, an, on a shelf. No one's ever touched it. And so all the transcripts were there. It was a uh, a real, you know, that was so when I went back to Carrollton, that's the that's the memory of Carrollton that I always want to have is this great, great period of searching and finding. Uh, but I've been back several times since I, I did a writer's writing retreat there when I was working on the manuscript, uh, just so I could sort of be in the area and, uh, you know, have some have a time to really write a lot of the a lot of the manuscript that I needed to get done. So but I love Carrollton. It's a it's a it's a fascinating and and really pretty cool town. I, I've been there a couple of times um, since I've moved to Georgia and it is quite lovely. But so, I mean, you actually did get to see the gun and the bullet though, right? I got to hold the gun. You know, he was, he was very accommodating and, and they still have all that material. Uh, and, but it had, it had literally not been touched in decades and it, and no one knew it was there. Uh, but it, uh, uh, it was it was really really fascinating and and actually being able to see the gun and look at it really helped uh, inform the narrative because the gun obviously becomes a very important part of the story uh, and 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 in the trials uh, the gun and the ballistics are very important. Well, 
so we know, of course, that you're you're still writing for the AJC, but what what are you working on now? Oh, um, I am, you know, outside of my work, my daytime job with the AJC, I am uh, starting to do some research on um, some other forgotten figures in Southern history. And this would really be more an explicitly Southern project, but I'm, I'm interested in a lot of the minority white voices in Southern history. And one of the reasons why is because I found Dan Duke such a fascinating person. I was like, there got to be Dan Dukes out there whose stories have not been told, have been lost, but people who were brave minority voices in the political sense, you know, who stood against uh, segregation and stood against injustice uh, with little chance of success. Um, I, I do think that Southern history is viewed primarily through the viewpoints of segregationist governors and senators, uh, the, the people who stood in the schoolhouse door and opposed, uh, you know, federal mandates for desegregation. But for every one of those, there were opponents. And I think those voices have been lost. And I kind of like to know a little more about them. Um, so that's sort of what I'm looking into right now. That, that sounds like a very fascinating project. Um, and, you know, if you happen to write another book, um, you know where to find us. Yes. So, Chris, thank you so much for joining this evening. Once again, the three death sentences of Clarence Henderson. If you'd like to pick up a copy, Acapella Books, the order link is over in the chat or wherever your local bookstore is, we'd encourage you. I, being the book nerd that I am, would also encourage you to, if you get it, do take a moment. The end papers with the historical photographs in them, um, I think it's just a, a stellar component to the book. And, and just truly add something. It's a very, very well-written, well-researched and, and well-produced book that uh, for anyone that wants to delve into this part of Georgia history, I think it's absolutely essential. So Chris, once again, thank you so very much for joining us tonight. Thank you to everyone who allowed us into your homes this evening. Have a wonderful evening and we will see you all again very, very soon. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.